those of us that have been on the progressive path for many years have a very deeply ingrained habit, namely that enlightenment, the recognition of our true nature, is the result of discipline, disciplining or focusing the mind, making some kind of effort. And this is one of the hardest things for someone who has been on a progressive path for many years to, to understand. Any effort the mind makes would necessarily involve the mind directing itself towards an object. Could you imagine making an effort, not just in spiritual matters, but in any matter, any sphere of activity at all? Could you imagine making an effort that didn't require the directing of your attention on an object? So, what we want to do here is to know the nature of the subject of experience, to know the nature of that that we refer to as I. And any effort the mind makes would take our attention away from the subject of experience towards the object. So, from this point of view, if we are making an effort to meditate, we are not meditating. We are controlling the mind. Now, in some approaches, meditation is synonymous with controlling or focusing or directing the mind. But in, here, in this approach, that is not the case. This approach is more about understanding or clear seeing than it is about efforting or disciplining the mind. What are we trying to see clearly or understand? The, the nature of experience, or in particular the nature of the one that experiences, that is the nature of the one we call I. And in order to see the nature of something, we have to look clearly at that thing. So that is why here we put so much emphasis, at least to begin with, on looking at, as it were, the experience of simply being aware. But that doesn't involve the focusing of our attention. We cannot focus our attention on the experience of being aware. We can only focus our attention on what we are aware of. So it involves this relaxing of the attention which for someone that is, who has been used to focusing their attention on a mantra, as indeed I was, it, it seems to be the opposite instruction. It is the opposite of focusing your attention on an object. It is relaxing your attention into its source. So that, that, that takes care of, of one half of, of what I would recommend doing. That's the inward-facing part of the path. Investigating the nature of that which you call I, or the experience I am, or the feeling of being, or the experience of being aware. And then the, the second aspect would be to turn around, as it were, to turn the mind around, instead of the mind sinking into its source, to face outwards again, face objects, face activities and relationships, and to try to live the implications of your newfound understanding in every realm of your life, activities, relationships. So in terms of what activity you would do, um, I would start by asking you, what, what, what activity do you love to do. If you are watching a, a movie or reading a novel for, for, the, for the joy of it, then carry on. But if you notice that you're watching TV or reading a novel to escape the feeling of boredom or dissatisfaction or lack that is present when you don't fill every moment of your time, then the best thing to be doing at that time would be not to watch the movie or read the novel, but to face that feeling of lack. It numbs temporarily that feeling of lack, but as soon as the watching or the reading 
subside, the feeling of lack will come up again. And then sooner or later, we have to turn around and face this lack. And that for many people is, is terrifying. But that's obviously not the case for you. You, you. you want to explore these matters. So in this case, the best thing to do would be just to put the book down, turn the movie off and sit down, close your eyes and face the feeling of lack and face the discomfort of it, face your attempt to avoid it. First of all, by uh, I mean, you're no longer avoiding it through uh, through food and drink and all the all the, the crude ways. You're avoiding it in more subtle ways, watching movies and reading books. But the subtlest way of all is thinking, repetitive thinking. That that is the the most common way to uh, avoid facing these feelings is just to lose oneself in, in a train of thought. It's the equivalent of reading a book or watching a movie. So. Be very sensitive in you to any impulse you have to avoid this discomfort. And don't be tempted to take that route. Fa face the, the discomfort. And face the discomfort not as a means to getting rid of it, but rather face it in order to understand it. But then if you find that you're watching TV or reading a novel for the, for the joy of it, then, then carry on. Not, not all your activities are a distraction from this feeling of boredom or sense of lack. You could only be distracted from an object of experience. But awareness is, pervades all experience equally. It doesn't matter whether you're gardening or watching a movie or, or sitting silently on your sofa with your, with your eyes closed. Awareness is equally available in all experience. So. And because awareness is not an object of experience, you cannot be distracted from it. Nothing that takes place in the movie prevents us from seeing the screen. So if you are, if you are gardening and your entire experience, it's clear to you that your entire experience is taking place in and is known by and is made of the presence of awareness, then you are in deep meditation while you're gardening. In fact, you would be in deeper medita in that condition, you would be in deeper meditation than you would be if, than if you were absorbed in, in Nirvikapa Samadhi, because you'd be in Sahaja Samadhi. Um, Nirvikapa Samadhi is the presence of awareness, absorption in the presence of awareness without objects, and Sahaja Samadhi, being knowing the presence of awareness in the, in the presence of objects. It's like meditation with eyes closed, metaphorically, or meditation with eyes open. So yeah. the Nirvikapa Samadhi, that's uh, the absorption in awareness without objects, is, is still a temporary state. Sooner or later, you're going to have to come back to objective experience. So Sahaja Samadhi is, is just a, the, the term when you're, when you stand knowingly as the presence of awareness in the presence of objects, when objects can no longer distract you from yourself because all there is to objects is yourself. So that, that's why I say if you're, if you're gardening and you know, you feel that your experience appears in the space of awareness, it is known by the presence of awareness, and it is made out of the awareness in which it appears, then you, you, there's nowhere to go from there. And you may change from one activity to another, from gardening to cooking, to seeing friends, to reading a book. But although the, the, uh, the outward activity changes, the, the reality, the substance of your experience remains constant. So you, you, go, you go from one activity to, a, to another, but you, you remain knowingly as the presence of awareness. So meditation is not something in this approach that starts or stops. It's not an activity we do with our mind. It is the, it is the very nature of our experience. You may still, time, some, still sometimes sit with your eyes closed on your sofa at, at home, just, ju just to rest. But you wouldn't preference that. You wouldn't call that meditation as opposed to gardening. It would all be the same.
And I was wondering, kind of, what does it look like to um, have awareness and your mind coexist? Because I feel like right now I'm in the point where it's either one or the other, and I was wondering kind of what it looks like to have both, because it's hard to stop thinking for more than a couple minutes. When you say, what's it like for the mind and awareness to coexist, you, you, the assumption is that they don't coexist. It's like asking, what's it like for the screen and the movie to coexist? Right? When this movie is playing, does it ever not coexist with the screen? Can you have a movie without the screen? Obviously not. So the mind is the movie. You, you can't have a mind without awareness because awareness is the, the knowing element in the mind. Take the perception of this room. The, your perception of this room is known. Yeah, it, by known I don't mean conceptually known, I mean known in the sense of being experienced. So you, you're your, your current perception of this room is known or experienced. And, and that knowing element, the knowing part of this perception is what's called consciousness or awareness. But there is also, that, that is, we, we could say it is the subjective element of the experience. The objective element is the the colors that you see, the form that you see, but they're not the subject and the object, they're not separate from each other any more than the, the screen and the image are separate. In fact, all there is to your current perception is the knowing of it. So in fact, all there is to perception is consciousness or awareness. So it's not even that the mind coexists with awareness as if the mind were one thing and awareness were another. There is just consciousness and this perception is a coloring, a self-coloring of consciousness or the activity of consciousness just as we could say the movie is a coloring or an activity of the screen. So all that's necessary is to discern in your current perception or your current thought or your current feeling, whatever it is, to discern the, the knowing element, which is equivalent to saying it's like seeing the screen whilst watching the movie. Well, you're obviously seeing the screen whilst watching the movie, but if you forget that you're watching a movie and think that it's a real landscape, you will think, oh, I am no longer seeing the screen. So if you are completely lost in your objective experience, the knowing element of your mind, the consciousness element of your mind, will seem to be missing. And as a result, you will seem to have to go in search of it. Mm -hmm. You will seem to have to reject your objective experience and go in search of it. But in fact, the knowing of your perception is shining in the perception itself, because you cannot separate the perception from the knowing of it. I feels like I can only, like I know to be one you have to be the other. Um, but for whatever reason, and I'm not sure if it's like conditioning, it feels like at any given point I can only be aware of either the screen or the movie depending on what I'm giving my, I don't want to say attention because that's a loaded term, but whichever I'm paying it, paying attention to. And it feels like when I'm sitting still and my mind is, um, calm, I can be focused on okay. the screen, but as soon as someone turns on the movie, it feels like that's my focus. Okay. So uh, um, imagine three separate conditions. You're, let's do it with the movie first. You're watching a movie and you're lost in the movie. The movie, is, of course, is uh, the analogy for experience, mind. So you're watching the movie, and all you see is the movie. You're lost in the drama. And because of this, in order to see the screen clearly, we have to turn off the movie. So first, in the first condition, first state, we're watching the, 
the movie. And the second, we turn off the movie and that enables us to see the screen. Yes, we, once the movie is turned off, we see the screen clearly. This is the either-or situation that you describe. Now, we now, in the third state, we turn the movie back on, but we keep seeing the screen. So first of all, just the movie. Second, just the screen. Third, the screen as the movie. We see both of them together. So it's the same thing now. Now we're, we're, we're lost in perceptions, in thoughts, in, in feelings. So we, we, we close our eyes in order to r remove the world. We turn away from our thoughts and we feelings and we focus, as it were. We give our attention to the experience of being aware. We don't pay any attention to objective experience. We just pay attention to being aware. Now, you can do both of those. You've said you can pay attention to your thoughts. You can be aware of being aware. But now you have to do the third element, which is to remain aware of being aware, but allow experience to come back. So try that right now. First of all, you're aware of your perceptions and thoughts and our conversation. Now just close your eyes for a minute and turn away from that and just simply be aware of the fact that I am aware. And now without losing that feeling of simply being aware, open your eyes again and carry on with the conversation. Is it not clear to you now that the awareness with which you are aware of your experience is, is, is present, it is you, and it is being colored by our experience and, and your perceptions. And you don't have to, it's, it's not that awareness is one thing in the background and experience is another thing in the foreground. But all there is to experience is the awareness of it. So in fact, it's, it's one experience. You don't have to separate out the subject awareness and the object, your thoughts and perceptions, although that's a legitimate first step that we take in the Vedantic path, the, the, the I am not this, I am not this, I am not this. That's a legitimate step, but you, you're familiar, you're comfortable with that. But now you have to let the, the subject awareness and, and its objects, thoughts and perceptions, c come back together. You turn the movie back on again and, and allow experience, uh, allow your attention to range freely over your experience, but not lose sight of, as it were, the fact that you are the, the knowing in every experience. To, to begin with, I understand exactly what you're saying, to begin with there is this either or. It's either objects or it's the subject. And in the early stages of this investigation, we go back and forth from the two, as we've done these first few days. We turn our attention away from the objects. We go back to the I am or the I am aware. And we go back and forth. That, that's legitimate to begin with. But now, for instance, this morning, we didn't do any of that. It was that the subject and the object were much more intimately merged together. So at some stage, we have to... Uh, allow this distinction between awareness and its object to collapse. But instead of losing yourself in experience, you let experience lose itself in you. So you stand, instead of, instead of consciousness losing itself in experience, you remain as consciousness and you see all your experience as a coloring of that consciousness. So there's no longer any distinction between yourself and experience. Yes, the, the distinction, as you rightly say, is the difference between knowing that you as awareness are always aware of yourself and that being your lived felt experience from moment to moment which, which as you rightly say seems to come and go but you say that these 
periods of forgetting are less frequent and they last for less and less time, which is very good. That's exactly the right way to go. Just continue to do whatever it is that in your experience reminds you in, a, in, a, in an experiential way, not just an intellectual way, in an experiential way of your true nature and just keep going back and back and back until it becomes second nature, until it just becomes as natural for you to think and feel of yourself as awareness as it used to be to think and feel of yourself as a body and a mind. Um, just and and use use whatever means are necessary. You of course understand that from the absolute point of view, uh, there is no practice, there is no discipline, there is nothing to do, etc., etc. All of that is true, but at a more relative level, there is something to be said for doing whatever it takes to remind us of our true nature. I used to write. I used to write on my bathroom mirror with, with, with a felt tip pen. So when I woke up in the morning and I was washing my face and shaving, there, there it was, roomy on my bathroom. I, every, use whatever it is. Use playful means, enjoyable means. That's partly why meetings like this are provided, books, or whatever it is for you. Just to... to keep going back and back. And the, to begin with, it feels that the moments of remembering, if we can call it remembering, are, are, they punctuate our normal state, which our normal state is to think and feel on behalf of a separate self, and, and therefore to act, perceive, and relate as such. And then this remembrance of our true nature punctuates this our, our normal state. After a while, these moments of remembering, as you rightly described, they get longer and longer. And they squeeze out the moments of forgetting. And after a while, there's a shift. It's the moments of forgetting that punctuate what is becoming more and more our natural state. And don't don't feel that these moments of forgetting are somehow a failure. Feel that, that on either side of these moments of forgetting, there is this remembering. And actually not just either side, but also underneath. At a certain time, the, the moments of forgetting, they happen. They're natural. They're no longer a problem because we feel they are completely surrounded by this remembering before the moments of forgetting, after the moments of forgetting, and somehow underneath, just out of sight. So they're completely surrounded and it just becomes more and more natural. If there are moments of forgetting, it's fine. The idea is not to be perfect as a body mind. If it's your experience that this remembrance is, is gradually taking over your whole life, it's perfect. Just keep going in that direction. When we spoke the other day, question and answer and I was talking about I had a sense of no beginning and no end but I had a fear of losing my body or death you said to me you've got to go to dinner you've got to move in and stop just going to dinner but I, I need yes. I'm just not clear do yes. I go through the same meditative process again to bring me back to yes. I am well you're aware already of the of the danger of going back to an experience in time, an experience that you had this morning, and trying to recreate it. So it, it's good that you're aware of the, the danger. But the experience that you had this morning was actually not 
a new experience that happened to you and then ceased. It, is, it was an experience of your ever-present and currently present essence, which is simply obscured much of the time by objective experience. So you do not have to look to the past to find that experience again. You have to look deeply in yourself to find it. And it may not, uh, and you can keep going to this experience of yourself through different pathways. This morning was one pathway. We've discussed the other, uh, other pathways. We, we've already discussed many pathways this week. And you can take any of these pathways. They're essentially all the same pathway. And, but don't expect that each time you return to, to your essence, don't expect it to be accompanied by the same side effects in the mind or the body. Now this morning your, your experience was, was accompanied by a, a, a very powerful experience both in your body and your mind. So there is something objective about this morning's experience that you can remember. But the objective content of this morning's experience is just the envelope in which the true experience was packaged. So don't expect to get that envelope again. Don't expect the same uh, objective. Don't expect the, the, the recognition of your true nature to be accompanied again by the same side effects in the mind or the body. Sometimes the recognition of our, in fact, often the recognition of our true nature is not of, accompanied by any remarkable side effects in the mind or the body. And if we're looking for remarkable side effects, we will then think, oh, it hasn't happened, something is missing, I need to go in search of that marvelous experience I had last week or, or last year. If, if, you want to, if you want to look for any, any sign that indicates to you that you're on the right track. Don't look for a particular experience because the experience of our true nature is, is it's invisible, it's transparent to the mind. It happens below the threshold of the waking state mind. And often the mind is not aware of it. And not, not, it cannot register, there's nothing there to remember. So if you want any, any kind of... Uh, test or any kind of um, sign, just look for the uh, degree of peace and fulfillment that you find in your life in general. Not a particular moment of peace, but just that, that, that the general, your general state of peace and fulfillment that you find in your everyday life. That would be the best indication as to the, whether you're going in the right direction or not. Don't look for anything more remarkable than that. heart of the heart. I am the voice of a child. I am wonder, astonishment and delight. I live in the space between thoughts, but I play in your thinking. My abode is the moment between breaths, but I dance in your breathing. Time and space move through me, but I do not move through them. I am never experienced, yet you experience only me. I never repeat myself, but I'm always the same. I have no goal but am the fulfillment of every desire. I have no feeling, 
but am open to all feelings. I have no thoughts, but all thoughts are an image of me. I am kindness itself. I am imperturbable and am thus peace itself. I am without resistance and am thus happiness itself. I am one with all seeming things and am thus love itself. I shine in the mind as I. I shine in the heart as you. I shine in the world as it. But I only ever am and know myself alone. I forget myself to taste the sweetness of longing. I divide myself to know the tenderness of friendship. I hide myself for the pleasure of seeking. I look for myself for the fulfillment of finding. I find myself for the knowledge of happiness. I know myself for the joy of being. I am myself for no other reason. I am closer than your breath. I am further than the stars. I am intimate but impersonal. I am peaceful like the sky. I am open like the sea. I am empty like space. I am luminous like the sun. I shine by myself. I am the substance and reality of all seeming objects and selves. I am the light of pure knowing. Turn towards me and I will take you into myself. I play, I enjoy, I am.